So you want to go to Alaska to see and photograph the world's largest brown bears and get up close and personal. And you've got questions like how to even get out to see the bears. And maybe you just want to know what to expect and what the reality of a wild bear adventure is. Well, let's talk about it. So the largest brown bears in the world are the Kodiak and coastal brown bears of Alaska. They have to be the most exciting and amazing animals in the wild to see, in my opinion. They're so cute and cuddly, kind of, and amazing at the same time, but they're also the deadliest animals in the wild. And that fine line is what makes great photography, in my opinion, and just that's what makes it so much more special. I guess the question that's on most folks' mind is, uh, how do we even go about setting something up to see these amazing creatures? Well, there's not a lack of bear tours or photography adventure tours in Alaska to see bears. But what we're going to concentrate on this video is two areas, Katmai National Park and Preserve and the Lake Clark National Park. Those two places are going to have your coastal brown bears, which are your largest bears in the world. There is one of the places with just a little bit bigger brown bears, that's the Kodiak Island. And that's going to be a whole other video in itself. What we're going to do now, we're going to concentrate on the Katmai and Lake Clark in this video. But which of these services is right for you for the type of bear experience that you want to have? Let's talk about a few categories of the viewing experience. And I'd break these up by first is how able bodied you are. Do you, are you not real fit or you have some hindrances to getting around for some reason? Or are you extremely fit? You know, you can bounce up a mountain at the drop of a hat. Well, where you fit within that spectrum will actually dictate what kind of experience or what kind of service you want to have on a bear trip. Another thing is, do you want to have other experiences along with your bear trip, such as fishing and bears, uh, flyovers of 10,000 smokes or other areas? What where the volcano erupted and left ash and stuff? It's a beautiful place. And the last thing is, how close do you want to get to the bears? Um, hopefully not as close as I got it, you saw in that thumbnail, but... Uh, that is the determination, how close you want to get. That'll determine what kind of trip you want to get on. Let's start with trips where you're not as able-bodied or you have companions with you who just can't get around as easily to go see the bears. And don't let that discourage you because there's still many ways to go see the bears under this criteria and probably one of the more popular and well-known excursions that are around that fit this category. So let's talk about the first thing for low fitness levels and that would be Brooks Falls. Um, it could be a middle excursion level too because there is walking to be had, but it does have many accommodations for all fitness levels. Uh, this area is really well regulated by the park service and a lot of areas are roped off to where you can and can't go. Uh, getting close to the bears in this area is not really going to happen. There's a lot of park rangers that are going to make sure you and the bears are safe, making sure you maintain a certain distance from those bears. Uh, it's very well maintained trails and it has a lot of viewing platforms and with those viewing platforms in the very busy times to go see the bears you'll have at times you're gonna have to wait because they'll let only so many people on the platform at a time so those people go up there and take their pictures watch for a bit and the park rangers will shuffle people out the next group will come up on that platform uh, there's a lodge and campground for tents in Brooks Falls so if you need to do want to stay over you can uh, it's inside a bear fence for all that area you can get off the main parts of the trails, like I taught those main, main, maintained trails, but if you do, you're going to need a bear guide to go in those areas and work with the park rangers on that. Uh, but again, it has many accommodations for all fitness levels within this area, so that would be the first area you can go to. So let's talk about probably the easiest fitness level or excursion level to go see the bears, and that would be the pontoon bear trips. Pretty self-explanatory. You fly out to an area, you meet up with the boat captain, you hop on the pontoon boat, and they take you up the rivers and in the lake and get you close as they can with the bears on the pontoon boat, and you just take your pictures on the pontoon boat. So pretty self-explanatory. So that's a real easy one. So the next one we'll talk about is the fishing and bear viewing trips. It's easy to max fitness depending on what type of fishing and hiking you're doing. Pretty much what it sounds like. You either hike along the river and fish in bear view, or you meet up with a boat and you fish from the boat and you view the bears from the boat. And you only need to be fit enough for the hike or the boat ride and able to fish, that is. And you can get fairly close to the bears depending on which type of trip you're on. Especially if you're hiking, you probably get close to the bears than you can in the boat, but it just depends on your guide or your, your fishing guide. 
So the next one up is the Bear Lodges within Lake Clark and Katmai Parks. Uh, an example of this would be like, maybe you can go look up yourself, is Silver Salmon Lodge. That's probably one of the more famous ones that I know of. And these lodges are operated within inside the national parks. And they're usually multiple day stays at the lodge from one day up to six days. They accommodate different fitness levels. So if you're very active, the middle of the road, they have packages and excursions for you. Uh, they'll either boat you or drive you in a, a four-wheeler with a trailer or something like that to where the bears are, where they know they are near the lodge. Uh, you can get close to the bears on these trips. Uh, just really depends on what kind of excursion you're on and uh, what's going on that day and worth what the bears are doing. Uh, you can also fish and bear view or sightsee view. Just depends on what kind of package you've booked with these bear lodges. So let's talk about the last type of trip I want to talk about, and that's the fly-out day trip or multi-day trips. And this is going to require a moderate to all the way up to extreme fitness levels. And it just depends on what kind of uh, terrain you're going to be on and where you're going, and your bear guide can tell you about that before you get going. And this is my preferred method way to see the bears. Uh, you work with the bear guide and flight service to get in and out of the parks. Uh, the bear guide could be part of the air service, or you book the bear guide separately and he will take care of the air, serv air service for you. Uh, this requires hiking in all cases. Um, some hiking, again, is more extreme than others. Uh, you have more remote locations that you're going to access by going this route. Uh, it's more flexible to find out where the bears are as opposed to the other options where you're pretty much stuck to one area where you're going to go to for the fishing or the lodge or the park or things like that. Uh, rain and weather can interrupt or cancel your trips on these day trips. And it can also dictate where you can go. Like in my last trip, I expected to go to Hollow Bay, what we were talking about. And then due to the bear activity being low there and the weather, we went to Geo Bay, Geographic Harbor that is, and actually ended up being working out well. It was a lot better trip. Uh, it will also require wading, mud, dirt, and all those excursions. It's going to be a little more wear and tear on you as far as dirt and, and the environment goes on this type of trip. Okay, now that you're aware of what kind of trips are available and kind of what kind of fitness levels that you need to have to go on these trips, I bet you're wondering the most important thing. How much does this stuff cost? Well, it depends on a lot of factors, but I'll give you a real quick breakdown and kind of estimation of those prices. So the first up is Katmai. If you're going to Brooks Falls just for a day trip, and that's a six to eight hour trip flying out of Homer, Seward, or Anchorage. And those run from about $600 to about $1,000 per person for that type of trip. If you stay at the lodge, it can get real expensive. The lodge is pretty expensive and, and the rate is varied from year to year. Uh, but it's going to run you a few thousand dollars. You're going to stay more than one day there. Uh, the lodge is expensive. Uh, there are tent sites also, and those tent sites are $12 per person. Now, they do get booked up the lodge and the tent sites really fast. So you're looking at one to two years in advance trying to reserve one of those places at Brooks Falls. So the next one is the lodges. Those can run here from $1,000 to $1,500 per night per person. That does include your flight in, your food, the guides, and your transportation around the lodge. Uh, the next one is the fishing and bear viewing, and those run from about thousand, two thousand dollars, depending on the outfit. And again, it includes your flight in and out, and your guide and the boat service to go fishing. The next one is your pontoon trips, and those run a little less than thousand dollars, and that's for your flight in and your boat ride also. So that's included. So the last one is the fly out guided service, and a full day for that is about eight hundred dollars to thousand dollars for a full day trip, and a half day trip can run you probably. $600 to $800. Might as well spend the extra $200 to do a full day. Uh, that does again include your flight in and out to the bear area and your guide taking you out to show you the bears. So with all the types of trips out of the way and knowing what it may cost you to go see those critters and the different fitness levels to go see them, let's talk about my favorite way to go see the bears I said earlier and that's a fly out guided trip. You can leave out of Anchorage, Seward, or Homer to fly out to the bear trips, but you're cutting your bear viewing times a, lot, a little farther flight. So my suggestion is to base a few days out of Kodiak Island if you're going to the Katmai area. Now, let me correct myself, if you're going to the Lake Clark area, it's not as bad to fly out of Homer. But with these fly out trips I'm talking about, they're going to the Katmai area instead of the Lake Clark area. So why base out of Kodiak Island to go see the Katmai bears? Well. Weather in Alaska is unpredictable, very unpredictable, and it rains a lot and you get a lot of wind, so you could have weather cancellations on these trips. 
And this way, if you're based out of Kodiak Island, you get more opportunities uh, for going and seeing the bears. So a minimum of three to four days is probably the smartest thing to do when you're going to Kodiak and going to Katmai to see these bears. And the flight from Anchorage to Kodiak is about 45 minutes. Those flights, they have flights that are early in the day, they have flights late in the day, so you can maximize the amount of time you're on Kodiak Island. You fly in early and you fly out late. And from Kodiak to Katmai, it's only about a 40, 45 minute flight, depending on which bay you're going to. So it's really easy to hop over and get back. Like even the trip I went on, it was supposed to be a full day trip, but the afternoon weather came in later and it forced us to have to leave earlier. We only got there about five or six hours instead of eight plus hours. And also it determined where we're going to go because the weather was, it was kind of sketchy. We didn't know if we were going to go that day, but during that morning, it looked like the winds laid down toward Geo Harbor. And if you go watch the other video, it'll tell you all about that stuff. So the cool thing is, is Kodiak Island itself has a lot of Kodiak brown bears, the largest brown bear in the world. And you can probably uh, work out with your guide on your shoulders part of your cat my trip to take you around Kodiak Island and show you the bears and other wildlife. Uh, or even on your cancel day, if you say your day gets canceled to go out and fly out, your bear guide's probably free also, and he can change that out to do a trip on Kodiak Island. So talk to him about that if you do this type of trip. You can also explore Kodiak on your own for deer, bears, puffins, foxes, whales. Whales go right by town. Sea lions, uh, harbor seals, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so on your days off, on your shoulder days on your trip, let's say your trip goes off without a hitch, doesn't have a weather cancelization. On those off days, you can drive yourself around and look for the animals. And again, if you do get canceled, you can go drive it yourself and look for those animals. All right, now on to the expectations of what the experience is like on a flyout trip. Well, the starter is bears. Uh, once you see how big these guys are, your brain, at least mine, couldn't really calculate what I'm seeing. Even after you leave, you're still kind of processing what you saw. Uh, seeing these bears in their environment, not a man-made environment or close to man-made things, because out on these flyout trips, you're not near any man-made stuff. There's nothing out there. It's just that's the bear's world, not yours. So that's what makes it so cool to me to see those bears in those environment. The next thing is water. Lots of water. Water is just involved in everything, uh, especially with these bears. Uh, for starters, in the source of rain at times, actually a lot of times here in Alaska, uh, creeks to cross, uh, ocean to wade through in those bays, uh, to go to and from the plains sometimes. Uh, it runs from shin deep to maybe knee deep to thigh deep when you're wading in and out. So you're going to need rain, the good rain gear and a good rain jacket. Uh, ideally waders and wading boots are good, but the, the guide service a lot of times are, can provide you hip waders or full waders on these trips. Just make sure you talk to your guide before you go out on that. So another reason for why water, it's the main reason the bears are there. And it's for the salmon and the clams, what they eat at that time of year. And both of those things re require the ocean tides. So the first thing is the salmon. As the tide comes up and rises, it, the fish ride the tide in because they're lazy. And they ride it up into the creeks and the bears are following those creek arms up to chase those salmon as the, as the tide gets deeper and deeper. Uh, second thing is, as the tide goes back out, it exposes the clams on the beach. The bears love digging for razor clams. So that's kind of what we're doing. The, the tides are dictating where the bears are, and we in turn are following those same tides around to follow the bears around to get our photographs and to experience those bears. The next thing to, to know about your excursion or experience is going to be the weather and the temperature. For the most part, it's going to be cool to cold. There may be times it's hot, but usually it's just cool to cold to most people. Uh, even if it's sunny out, it could still be cool or feel cold. It just depends on what's happening. So I would suggest you dress in layers, and that way you can take clothes off or put clothes back on, depending on what kind of temps are, what kind of activity levels you're involved in at that time. Uh, it does rain a lot, like I said. In the last two years, it's rained a lot. So good rain gear, of course, is important, but another way is to keep your hands dry. You gotta need something to keep your hands dry, some good rainproof gloves or some type of towel or something to keep your hands dry. Because if you don't, you're gonna get cold and your hands are gonna get cold and you'll be miserable. So what kind of photography environment is it? Well, for the most part, it's open landscapes. The three main areas you're gonna go to, Hollow, Fraser, or Geographic Harbor, that are bays and, and they have river tributaries and you follow and set up along these creek arms or bays depending on what the, how the bears are behaving and what the tides are and what if the if the salmon are not in if they're clamming those type of activities 
So it means you can usually see the bears at least at a long distance, and in some cases, like where I was at, they were in shorter distances. Uh, there's not a lot of elevation changes out in this area, uh, but there is some distance you could walk, and those could range from a mile or a couple miles up to tens of miles. So make sure you discuss with your bear guide you know, what kind, how far you think you're going to walk on that given day on this type of trip or, you know, which type of trips he's going to go on. So what kind of focal ranges or what kind of lenses should I bring to go photograph the bears? Well, all of them, of course. Uh, wouldn't we all love that? Even down to the macro lens would be great because I there's stuff I could take a macro off of one or two of it. But for reality purposes, I would say bring something that goes anywhere from 15 to 24 millimeters all the way out to 500 to 600 millimeters. You could probably get that done, that done with two lenses. In most cases, you could either bring a wide angle and a, and a large zoom, or you could bring a prime and a, a mid-level mid uh, type of focal range. Um, the bears could be like five to 10 feet from you or several hundred yards from you. So that's why you kind of need that longer focal range. Uh, also try to bring the fastest apertures you can bring. If you can bring a 2.8, f4, 5.6 better, it's not necessary, but it's, it's good if you can because sometimes it's cloudy or rainy so you don't have as much light to work with. So that's what I would suggest as far as lenses. Try to bring two and try to bring those as, as much of that range as you can get to shoot your bears. So another question, even when I had, what about snacks and drinks? Well. Talk to your guide for starters, but I'd leave the snacks and drinks at home unless it's just needed for health reasons. Uh, bear smell is amazingly good. Uh, close encounters with food and stuff is not a good idea. The, your guide service should tell you what you can and can't bring, what they suggest you can bring and not bring. Uh, most of the times they're going to have stuff in the plane for you to eat or snack on or water, things like that. Bring, bring water be fine. But I think with the snacks, be careful with those. But just talk to your guide service, and they'll tell you about the snacks, what you should bring or shouldn't bring. Getting close to the bears. Well, aren't you supposed to stay away from bears? Uh, and aren't you scared getting that close to bears? Well, in general, if I was outside of this area, yes. But this is a guided bear trip, and which, which means you need to make sure you get a good bear guide and a well-respected bear guide, for starters and listen to your bear guide and let them do their job and ask as many questions as you want and but make sure you do what they tell you when you do when they tell you to do it because that's their whole thing is keep you and those bears safe uh, the guides are out all the time out there and they have to attain a certain level of certification to even do this work and they know what these bears are doing they know all the bears they, they can tell you the behavior of all the bears they're seeing in their area if they let the bear get close, just listen to their instructions and enjoy the experience is the best thing I can tell you. And yes, it is unnerving to be that close and amazing at the same time like what happened to me. People ask me all the time, when you got sniffed, were you scared? Not a lot. I, mainly I was more curious and interested to see what's going to happen because part of my brain is saying, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Nothing you can do about it. But I also know at the same time, I've got two bear guides with me that know exactly what that bear is going to do. They know how it's going to act for the most part. And they know what I need to do, what they need to do to keep me and that bear both safe, right? So yeah, it's, it's unnerving, but it's also amazing at the same time when those bears get that close. Just remember, rely on your guide, listen to them. That's the biggest bit of advice I can tell you. Listen to that guide, do what that guide tells you. Don't argue, don't question, just do it and do it then, right when they ask you. Best advice I can give you. So how many bears should I expect to see when I go out on one of these trips? Well, as in wildlife, as if you've ever done wildlife photography, it just varies. You could have a good day and have a bad day. So talk to your guide service about the best times to go see bears in the area that you want to go see them. Uh, salmon, grass species, clam availability, all those type of things will affect where the bears are congregated. And you have to remember that the only time these bears will tolerate each other and get close to each other is during the salmon run. The rest of the time they have nothing to do with each other. They'll kill each other or fight if they get close to each other. So during those peak times of summer and early fall, that's when the bear activity is best because they all get in one area because that's where all the salmon are at. Where we were at, we probably had about 20, 25 bears around us. We didn't have a ton of bears, but they're extremely active in these, these creek arms just fishing all around, kind of circling us the whole time. And after a while, you start to recognize the behavior of each of these bears. We had one bear that just fed on scraps for the other bears. The other bears that eat it, they don't eat all the fish. They leave pieces of it around. This bear just go around collecting them and stuff. 
And then we had one mama bear that she would just run full speed into the creek, two hops, get a fish. She would get about three or four fish. Then she would sprint off to the next creek and do the same thing, bounce. She was just never into moving around this whole time we were there. And then we had a big, that big male we had that the print giveaway I got, he would just saunter up and he just an old wise one. He'd walk up and he'd make a couple swipes and have a fish. He'd go over there to eat it lazily. Then he'd wander down and just saunter down to the next area. Pretty cool to watch. And then you get the younger bears, you know, that were the four or five year old bears that just get to play and tussling as just little kids and teenagers do. And then, of course, the younger bears can fish very well, so they do a lot more splash and a lot more diving. So it's, it's real fun to watch them. So again, the end answer to that question is, just depends on the day and what's going on as far as the salmon and the clam activity that they can do on. The next thing people talk, ask about is about the float plane. You know, did you fly in and out on? Um, a lot of people say, I've never been on one. Are they scary? I'm kind of scared of those little things, those bush planes. And I, I, no, I think they're pretty cool. Now, that is if you like to fly. If you like to fly, they're really cool. Uh, when you're taking off, it's pretty smooth. And you're landing, it feels kind of like being on a waterbed. Uh, there can be chop in bad weather, but usually not. Um, you have headphones on when you're on the plane, so you don't really hear the rumble and roar of the plane. Uh, you have a microphone and headset so you can listen and talk to everybody on the plane. Uh, listen to your pilot, ask him all the questions you want to ask him, but definitely listen to what he has said, follow his instructions, don't touch anything on the plane or mess anything on the plane unless the pilot's told you you can touch it or mess with it. Uh, but do ask all the questions you want to ask, because Alaskans love talking about the state they live in. Uh, the planes do fly low, so you get to see a lot of scenery, the wildlife. Um, the trip I went on the last one, we saw elk, moose, bears. We saw some uh, uh, fin whales. We were flying over top of them. It was really cool to see that. Now for the most important part of this video, at least I think so, and that's the lessons I learned from my trip and the mistakes I made on this trip. And these are mistakes I want to help you avoid. And the first thing, of course, you might think it's simple and easy was lens choices. I talked a little bit earlier about lens choices, what I would suggest. Here's where I screwed up. I assumed we were heading to one destination, Hollow Bay. And I packed the day's bag for going to Hollow Bay, which meant I was going to have more longer distances of the bears and be able to work around more on the bears, more area to walk. Well, the area we ended up going to was a medium to short distance. We were at a fixed spot and the bears would go around us or come to us and get really close to us. So pack without knowing where you're going to go. Pack for all circumstances because, you know, the, the change that happened to us changed the way I needed to shoot. And it was a good thing because the bear activity was really good, but I didn't have any short throw lenses to get those bears when they got within 5, 10 feet of me. So that's one lesson learned. So I'd say uh, have at least one zoom or prime at the long focal ranges, because I did have to shoot several hundred yards away from me. Something at 100 to 600 zoom type would be perfect. And then have a 7200, a 28 or a 14 to 35 type range lens for the shorter ranges. Either one of them I think will work really good. I think 70 will still get you when you're fairly close, but when they're in five feet, yeah, even a 14 millimeter been hard to get them all in there. The next thing you need to make sure you bring is bring your rain protection for your camera gear. Uh, rain coats by lens coat are a great thing to have. I forgot both of mine for both cameras. I left one in Anchorage and I left one in the condo or the, the Airbnb we were renting. Uh, that was my silly. I could see outside it was raining. I don't want to bring them. I really just assumed the rain protection on both cameras would be perfect for it. Now, it was for the R5. R5 did not have a hitch due to the water. The R7, it had video hitches, but I could still shoot pictures. So it didn't die, but it did have problems with that. So if I had the rain gear for the cameras, that'd be good. Now, even if you don't think it's gonna rain, still take the rain gear with you, the rain covers for you. Uh, just better prepared than not prepared. The next thing was the pumice and sand versus all my gear. So I did, the R7 didn't have as many problems with the pumice and sand, but I didn't use that as much as I used the R5 when I was laying down on the, on the, the, on the ground. So pumice would got into the crevices of the buttons and the buttons stopped working on the R5. So bring a towel or gloves or anything that you can get that sand and pumice off your hands when you're on the ground in those wet conditions. 
on your belly, sitting on the ground, crawling around on the ground, whatever, that pumice is going to get in everything. Even if you're not getting your hands on it, it still somehow finds its way into all the crevices on the, com the camera. Another bit of advice I would say due to the pumice and the sand would be to buy one of the silicone easy covers. And those are just silicone covers that go over the top of your camera and, it'll, and they go over the buttons so you can't get sand and stuff in those buttons, which is really nice. Now, it doesn't cover every button, but it covers the main button you're going to use. Uh, so what I would say is don't anticipate the day's action or how you're going to be able to film and photograph that day because something else is going to dictate what's going to happen. You know, I thought I didn't know I was going to be stationary. I thought I was going to be mobile or vice versa. So make sure you have gear for all situations when you shoot. And I made the rookie mistake of not taking all the gear out. I assumed I was going one place. I was geared for that place. And then when I went to the next place, I had a handicap on me. Still had a blast. Still got great pictures. But I could have got more. Could have got better if I had a better range selection of lenses with me. Next thing was the temperature. Um, I didn't really get cold, but my uncle did. It was raining the whole times on there. And the only thing it did is my, my knuckles, my hands got a little bit cold. And by the time I got to the plane waiting, my knees got a little cold, but they kind of warmed up real quick. Bailey was raining on this whole time and pretty cold. So uh, one thing I wish I would have brought, I wish I would have brought some waterproof gloves with me or something to keep my hands a little warmer or dry my hands off. So that was the one mistake I made is make sure I have a way to dry my hands off. That would have helped a little bit. Well, I hope maybe this helps make that Alaska brown bear photo trip for you a reality. I will say that those bears in that environment are constantly on my mind and I'm constantly thinking about next year's trip and how to plan and how to make it better. Uh, guys, leave me a comment in the comment section about anything you'd like to know about these bear adventures or if you need most, more specifics or maybe even help, how to help plan your own bear adventure. Uh, until next time, guys, go watch this video over here about that bear trip I took. I'll tell you what, I even watch my own video about once every other week. I love watching those bears and, and remembering that whole trip. So until next time, guys, uh, take care and be safe.